I close this or not? So I know what I'm going to be saying to you today by heart, but I'm still going to hold it in my hand right here just so that I have some support in case uh, I, I lose my track or something like that. Um, this is the first time I'm going to be speaking about my Seattle restaurant and the experience I had in Seattle for more than five minutes. And um, I keep asking for more time on this. Um, the first thing I want you to do is just suspend some words such as wonderful and lovely and amazing, because that's something I have heard about our kitchen staff for now 28 years, such lovely ladies, wonderful ladies. And you know what? We are not. We are just like you. We suck sometimes. We are just like you. And my whole point and my excitement of getting up here is to basically inject in us this feeling that, you know what, no one is more wonderful. We are basically at heart all the same, trying to do the same things. So let me start with myself. I was born on October 19th, 1964, in Delhi, India, to mom and dad, who themselves were children of war, from the War of Partition of 1947, when India and Pakistan were uh, separated into two countries. My bloodline, my ancestry, my mom and dad, they were born in what is now Lahore, Pakistan. Dad was 10 years old, and my mother was eight years old when they became refugees. They were wanted refugees in India because they were Hindu, but nevertheless, they were refugees. They left, the mom and dad, um, or my grandparents, left everything, and my father ended up living in a refugee camp the Kingsway camp of Old Delhi for about seven years. Um, I was born October 19th, 1964. December 1st, 1969, we are on a plane and my mom, my dad, and I are headed to Washington, D.C. In, in America. My first five years of my life, I have no solid memory of it. I try. It's a white, it's a fuzzy, white, blank slate. I don't know. I don't know if I have feelings, if they're coming from something that happened to me in India. And I mean, I'm told that, you know what, your first five years are the most crucial. I can't remember mine. But one thing I do remember, and I think I've reimagined this memory a lot. I think I've recreated it however it suits me. But some facts I do remember is um, the flight, getting on that plane with my mom and dad. My mom is in the aisle seat. I'm pretty sure it was Pan Am. My mom is in the aisle seat. She's wearing this bizarre olive green London fog coat that has some rips in it. And I'd never seen my mom wear such a coat before because while well, we were coming from India, she was in the aisle seat. She was tearing up a lot and she was crying a lot. My dad was in the middle. And my dad's a, he's a, he's a, uh, he's a bundle. Let's put it that way, all right? Uh, <laughs> He, he's not an easy one. And then I had the window seat. And um, it's on the plane that my father tells me, and I think he's trying to cheer me up. And uh, he says, you know what? As long as I can find cucumbers for myself and chai for your mother in America, we're going to be okay. Now, instead of making me feel better, I actually, I stressed. I thought, wait a minute. Isn't this something you should have checked out before? <laughs> um, like, what are we going to, like, I had, I had a knowledge that we can't undo what we are doing right now. We can't go back. And I remember just thinking, like, how, oh, here we go again. And, um, and he says, well, hold on, no, your mother has brought her chai. Your mom has her tea in the suitcase. Your mother even brought her sitar. Her sit, uh, sitar, it's an Indian instrument. He says, but cucumbers you can't put in the suitcase. And I said, okay, all right, at least mom is okay. And then I asked him why mom is wearing the coat. And he says to me that, uh, oh, well, your mom has a baby in her stomach. And um, the Americans can't find out about this baby because between the time that um, we applied to go to America and us getting the visas for America, your mom got pregnant. And um, so we're hiding the baby, but mom's crying because we tried to get rid of this baby twice. Now, I'd had no idea what that meant. I said, what do you mean you tried to get rid of the baby? And they're like, well, we, ha you know, we, had, we, we had to get rid of the baby, otherwise we couldn't come here. But anyways, the baby wanted to stay, and your mother doesn't know if something's going to be really wrong with this baby, and she's just scared, so that's why you're sitting here. Leave your mother alone. So with that heavy, heavy burden that my father used to cheer me up, okay, <laughs> I landed as a five-year-old on December 1st, 1969 in Washington, D.C. Um, so 
I got to it. My father got to it. He found his cucumbers. My mom had a beautiful baby girl, my baby sister. And the three of us got going. My sister, you know, she was a baby. Um, I went to school, learning English, trying to fit in. Dad went to work. It was my mom who was stuck at home. It was my mother. She had her sitar at home, but mom had no community. Mom didn't know English. Mom had no situation to even get out there and learn English. How do you do it? She's missing her own community at home. Um, she has a newborn baby. Baby. And I watched my mother struggle. I watched my mother go from one demeaning, condescending job to another. I watched my dad thrive. I was thriving. My sister was okay. And you know what? It's a burden. It's a burden that I couldn't help my mom. I, I couldn't support my mom because I needed my mom to be my mom. I needed my mom to be my support. And so I, I couldn't help her out. But I always felt it. I saw it, the sadness. And then she would get up and leave as a sadness, and um, it, it, it stays with you. So as an adult, um, one thing that came to me very naturally, I didn't even plan it. It's not like I sat down and you know came up with an idea, is I was gonna create workspace. I was gonna create the workplace. I was gonna create careers. I was gonna create a safe place for my moms. I couldn't help my own mom, but I was going to help my moms of today, and when I say today, I'm talking about from 1994 all the way up through to today. So uh, in on, uh, February 2011, uh, Oz Istif, he, is, he was one of the you know, two main managers at Vidges and Rangoli. Oz and I had an opportunity, were given an opportunity to open up a restaurant in South Lake Union, Seattle. So Paul Allen's real estate company, Vulcan, owned this big swath of land, and it was being rented out by Amazon, um, 18,000 Amazon employees. It was the campus of Amazon, and basically we were being offered a million to about a million and a half dollars, open up your own restaurant. Here you go, here's the money, open it up, call it what you want, two things, it has to be fine dining, and you have a 12-year lease, and that's how you're gonna pay us back, basically. You're gonna be in business for 12 years. And, um, I had two concerns about this. It was a very attractive offer, and plus it was me. Uh, in Vancouver, I was always known as half of Vikram, half of Vidges. Um, it was a chance for me to do something on my own. And uh, so I, but, uh, but like I said, I had two concerns. Number one was this fine dining. Uh, Amazon employees, we were told the mean, or the, I think the average income of South Lake Union was $96,000 a year. So hence, fine dining. But I wasn't convinced. I wasn't convinced that fine dining was what was needed there. But Vulcan, they said, no, 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 we know what we're talking about. So, okay, fine, I, I, can, I, can, I can do fine dining. Number two was, I wasn't sure, could I recreate the Vidges and the Rangoli kitchen in Seattle? I knew there were immigrant women there. Um, and I'm not saying this from the economic point of view. You know, a lot of people, I've gotten hate mail sometimes, like, oh, she's taking advantage of immigrant women. And it's like, no, I, I'm not. That's not why I'm doing it. I do it for me. That's where I get my source of creativity from, is what am I creating? Recipes are simple for me. Recipes are like, yeah, I come up with a recipe a day. That's not an issue for me. It's who am I creating these recipes with? Who am I cooking with? What am I creating together? And my people are immigrant women. It doesn't matter where from. But immigrant people, those are my people. And so I thought to myself, I don't know, can I recreate the same thing in Seattle? So I go to Amarjeet, she's the general manager um, at Vidges, well, not, uh, in the kitchens. And I went to Bindu, I went to my Vidges staff, and I said, here's the deal, what do you think? Shall I do it? Should we go to Seattle? Can we do it? And Amarjeet says, I don't know if we can do it, but you're going to do it. We are going to get these Vidges jobs, and we are going to figure out how to open up a restaurant in Seattle. That's it, we said yes. So Oz gets to work front of the house, I get to work back of the house, and we have planned December 1st, 2011 as opening uh, night. And it's not easy to find staff. Um, in Seattle, in the US, I can tell you one thing, immigrants of color who are not educated are hidden. They're really hidden. They live in places so far out where there isn't public trans. It's a, it's a different, it's a, it's a hard, hard situation. It's a much harder situation over there. 
Um, Amarjeet found out she decided to go to Walmart, and so she canvassed at Walmart. She would find a family that she thought had good energy, and that was it. She would go directly and start speaking to them in Punjabi and say, do you have a woman in your family that can't find a job and wants to work? Here's the card. I went to the 7-Elevens and I went to the gas stations and I offered up my card to the men working there. And I said the same thing. Do you have a woman in your family that is looking for work, has no job experience and can't find a job? Here's my card. And we did that. And you would think that it would be easy to find women to work. No, it was not. There was a lot, but it was not easy. But fast forward here. And um, November 1st, I had seven women. Seven women ready to work and um, no experience and all of them were new immigrants from, from India. And all of them young moms, except for one woman, and I'm gonna call her Auntie. And you'll notice Auntie in there somewhere, she's in the middle wearing a blue, a blue suit. And um, Auntie was the only one, she was six, in her 60s. And the way it works, it's not like everybody's a ready-made cook. It's, it's not like, hey, Come on in and I'm going to teach you how to... You kind of figure it out, right? You figure out who wants to cook, who's better at prepping, who's actually going to just do the dishwashing. You just kind of figure out who kind of fits in where. The one person who couldn't fit in anywhere was auntie. And, uh, you know, the dishes, it's too heavy for her. Cutting? Absolutely not. Um, it, it was really hard for me, but she was smiling and she's walking around and looking kind of busy. And so for me, she was like, okay, um, uh, seven is not enough. And I talked to Amarjeet, so my Viju staff is helping me here, right? They're helping me with all the training. And so I said to Amarjeet, Amarjeet, what, like, what is auntie? And she's like, just, just, just leave it. And so, um, it's, I don't know, like three days go by and my, my clock is ticking, December 1st, okay? I don't have a kitchen ready and auntie's actually driving me bananas, okay? <laughs> She's really driving me bananas. And so then there's another woman there working, uh, Babu is her name, nickname, and I said, Babu, um, you know, I, I don't think it's going to work out. I'm speaking in Hindi, by the way, okay? And they're speaking back to me in Punjabi. And I said, I don't think it's going to work out with auntie. Um, how, do I, how do I tell her? And Babu looks at me, she goes, oh, you can't fire. You can't, you can't tell her not to work. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, first of all, she needs this job. And second of all, it's her son that drives us an hour and a half every morning here. And then her other son picks us up and takes us back home. I have three kids. My husband doesn't have a job. I need this job and I don't have this job without auntie. You are not getting rid of auntie. And I was like, okay. And it sounds funny right now, but I was cursing under my breath at this time. I don't want this to sound like it's some romantic little story here. I was stressed. I couldn't eat. My arms were sweating. And my December 1st was TikToking. And so I said, all right, fine, auntie, we're going to teach you how to cut. We're cutting. She has a big knife in front of her. Um, I, I work, Amarjeet works with everybody else, Binda works with everybody else, I work with auntie. She figures out onions and garlic and bell peppers and all that stuff, very slow, but she figures it out. And then finally, I said, all right, auntie, and I bring out a leg, uh, some legs of lamb, okay? I bring out the leg of lamb because it's, you know, we're learning how to cook new recipes and I have a lamb recipe. And she looks at it and she puts the knife down and then I got to put this down and she does this, she goes, oh, I go to like this and she goes, no, no. No Miruji, no. And I said, what do you mean, no? And she goes, no Miruji, I don't touch meat. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, you don't touch meat. And she goes, no, I don't touch meat. And I said, uh, okay. And then I'm thinking here, like, I've got to do something. What do I, like, I lose all of my staff or this, this, this lug here who doesn't touch meat suddenly um, is not going to be able to bring them to work. And so I, I just, I got mad. I did, I got mad. And um, I said, I said, auntie, I said, you know that um, your paycheck comes from people who are eating meat, okay? Look at this menu. It's in, she couldn't read it. It's in English, right? I said, your paycheck is coming from people who are going to be eating a lot of lamb popsicles, okay? Chicken, beef. And, and she's like, oh, if I go to, you know, making, you know, like, that. I said, pork, pig, pig, auntie. You have a lot of, people are going to be eating these animals. That's how you're getting your paycheck. So... If you are okay getting a paycheck from people who are going to be eating meat, you got to ask yourself, are you really not guilty by not cutting it? <laughs> right? Like, like you're, so what, your hands might be clean when you're not touching this meat, but you go home and think about it, then can your hands accept the paycheck from the meat? Now, 
you haven't lost your job or anything because I couldn't lose the other employees. I said, you haven't lost your job, but you really need to think hard about accepting a paycheck that's coming from people eating meat, okay? And she just looked at me and she's like, okay. And then she came back the next day and she says, Miruji, bring me the lamb. <laughs> and so auntie started cutting meat and she, she, she started cutting super slow, but nevertheless, we found work for auntie. Um, so we're, you know, we're going... And um, I'm still short-staffed at this point, but Vidya's staff is coming. And uh, we had, Oz and I decided that since December 1st was the um, opening day official, November 28th and 29th, we decided to do two dry, like, or soft, what we call soft openings. 140 people each night. And um, so just, just for practice sake. So we are training away 16-hour days, and I really have to do a, like, my Vigis staff, man, they kicked in. They were taking turns. They were doing Vigis shifts at night until midnight, and then taking the bus 5 a.m. the next morning to come in and train. And this is because they felt it. They felt the jobs in that kitchen. They felt the opportunities, what we were creating there for other women. And um, so November 29th, um, came and one thing I had done is I had I had someone had told me that there was a notable Ethiopian population in Seattle and um, And so I through a contact in Vancouver I had asked her can you just kind of get the word out there in the Ethiopian community that you know There's a restaurant and she's hiring and she doesn't need you don't need any work experience and um, on the 29th in the morning um, Basically, I was going to be the dishwasher with auntie um, not looking forward to it. Um, but at 10 a.m., this guy knocks on the door, and I go. It's the 20, it's the, like the first soft opening night, and he has a thick Ethiopian accent, and he says to me, are you looking for a dishwasher? And it was like he fell out of the sky for me, right? And uh, I was like, yes, I, I'm looking for a dishwasher. And he just beamed at me, and his name was Nega. And he says to me, he goes, my wife got here from Ethiopia three months ago, and she is, and he said this, he goes, she's sitting at home, watching television, getting fat and depressed, and she needs a job. And I was like, okay, um, sure. And so I said, but she has to come at three o'clock so I can teach her how to run the dishwasher and everything. So we're working, getting ready to go. And then at 3 o'clock, the door knocks, and there he is with his wife. Bizunesh is her name. And Bizunesh is holding a baby, and he is holding two boys, four and six, dressed up in bow tie suits. Okay? Bizu is wearing shimmy champagne pink pants, and she is wearing silver stiletto high heels. And she is wearing like a beige, silky top coming down to here. Her hair is done, big earrings, lipstick, and they are walking in, and, and, and he's taking pictures of her, right? <laughs> he's taking pictures of her. And O's looks, he goes, Mito, what is this, right? And this is my new dishwasher. <laughs> um, but O's knows to leave it. O's knows that, all right, you know what? However she does it, I, I, I'm going to leave her alone. And so I, you know, I... Um, I well, say hello to Bizu, Bizu is what we call it. I say hello. And, um, and then she speaks zero English. Okay? Like, not, like my other kitchen staff, I speak to them in Punjabi or in Hindi. She speaks zero English. And so Nega stays and the kids stay. And he translates to her what I'm telling her all about the dishwasher and she's nodding. And then I say, okay, she can't wear these shoes. Like, she, like, we have a problem. She needs shoes. He tells her, and then she says to me in English, no problem, and she just kicked off her shoes. <laughs> and so that night, Bizu, in those clothes, barefoot, she was the dishwasher for 140 customers. And so he left, uh, Nega left, and then I was to call him, and I came back, or not came back, called him, very chaotic night. It worked. It was a gong show, but it worked, okay? It worked. And... Um, I was still short-staffed, and so then he came back around midnight, and um, I'm in the back at the bar. I think Oz and I were talking about whatever went right or wrong, and I come back, and there she is, barefoot, and she's doing the dishes, and her husband is just watching her, going, mm-hmm, <laughs> just nodding and watching her. Just, like, the pleasure they were getting, I was, it was like I was interrupting some romantic <laughs> scene. Right, and so I get in there finally, and I said, you know what, tell her she did a great, she did a great job. She did such a great job. And somehow she reminded me of I Dream of Jeannie. I don't, 
I don't know, but the earrings and just the way she was and the shimmering pants and happy. And it was just, she, she just reminded me of Jeannie. And um, so then uh, we're talking, I said, you got to get new shoes. You can't wear, and she figured, they figured it out that, you know, you got to, you can't dress like that. And then I said, I need more staff. I need more people for, I, I, you know, for the night time, I need more staff. And um, he says something to, you know, in, in Amharic to Bizu. And then uh, he says to me, how many do you need? And I said, uh, four new staff. So the next day at 10 a.m. comes in Gabriella, Tutu, Baggerle, and Henna. And I've got a staff. And uh, we start training. And, and the same thing happens. Everybody just kind of figures out what they're going to be doing except for Auntie. <laughs> and Auntie's still floating around and cutting. And the Ethiopian women, man, they can chop. They can chop faster than any chef professionally, and it's frightening to watch them. They're, not, they're using restaurant knives, and their hands are like this, and they're chopping like this. Really, really, it, it, was, it was great. And so, you know what? We, we got going. We actually got going. But then I realized about a week in that um, the Ethiopian women sat here and the Indian women sat there. They weren't having dinner together, and... Um, and it was, it was, I wasn't used to that. I wasn't used to this divide in the staff. And so um, I sat in the middle one night, and um, Auntie was right there. And, uh, and, Auntie, and I said, Auntie, why aren't you guys, why aren't you sitting together? And she said, well, we don't speak any, we don't speak the same language. Um, we don't speak English. We don't speak their basha. Basha means like their language. And they don't speak any, we don't speak the same language. And then she goes, and plus they are, they're a different religion. They eat meat. And I was like, oh, the meat part again. Um, and then the other Indian woman, uh, Ravi, she says to me, she says, well, yeah, but then either they're, like, either they're fasting and they're vegan and they won't eat paneer and they won't eat yogurt, either they're fasting or they eat meat, all right? And I said, yeah, they're Orthodox Christian. Um, and, and I realized right there that, okay, we're having an issue not only of language but of religion and culture. And I had an idea right there and then, and I just said, okay, okay, I'll tell you what. Um, we're going to empty out the janitor's closet in the kitchen. It's a big closet. We're going to empty out the janitor's closet in the kitchen, and we are going to have our own God closet. The name of this restaurant, by the way, is Shonic Restaurant, just if you're wondering as you see it right there. I said, so Shonic Restaurant's going to have its own God closet, and you are all you can bring in, a symbol, a photo, whatever you want of your God, and your God's going to go in this closet so that we can all respect one another's gods, Okay. So we're going to do that. In addition now, let me talk to you all about me. They did not know anything really about me except that I was this boss that was hiring all these women. So I told them the same story I told you about that five-year-old girl who landed on the plane in Washington, D.C. in 1969. And especially the Ethiopian, especially Tutu, she, um, she, she goes, she had this like epiphany. She goes, wait a minute, so you are like my daughter. So you understand what my daughter feels like. My daughter is five. And I said, yes, I do. Suddenly I became like this um, person, like this go-to to understand their children. And, um, and, and we made that connection right there. And then the Indian women, they were like, oh, we just thought you came from this really educated family and your mom cleaned bathrooms, really? And I said, yes, my mom cleaned bathrooms. So it, it like the frosting was spread, right? Right there, the frosting was spread. And then... Um, I said to Oz on the way out, and it was late, I said, Oz, can you bring something from like Turkey or something Muslimy? And he's like, what? And I said, can you bring something Muslimy? He goes, for what? And I said, for the God closet that we're going to have tomorrow. <laughs> and, um, and I said, one of us needs to participate in the God closet. I'm an atheist, so I can't participate. I erased the God closet. Um, and plus, that's a secret. We can't tell them right now until they're really happy at their jobs that I'm an atheist, okay? But you are a Muslim. Can, and he said, we don't have photos like that. I said, just bring something. I don't care, right? Just bring something. So the next day, um, they're all, you know, they're supposed to bring something. And then Auntie, as she's walking out, she comes to me. This is the night before. And she says, Miruji, I have an idea. And I said, what? And she said, you just wait. And I was like, okay, all right. And so then the next day, everybody's you know, bringing stuff. The God closet's all cleaned out, and Auntie comes early, all right? The other women are waiting outside, but Auntie comes early at 3.30, and uh, she goes to the back, and she just smiles at me, and then she changes into her clothes, 
And, um, and Oz asks, are we paying Auntie the extra half hour of labor cost? And I said, I don't know what's going on here. Just be quiet. And, uh, and so then Auntie goes to the front door of Shawnick Restaurant, and she stands there. And at 4 o'clock, as every single staff person, I'm going to tear up, as every single staff person walked in, front of the house and back of the house, she gave each one a big hug. That's it. She each a big, big hug. Not just a little pat, pat corporate hug, a big hug. Front of the house was like, oh, hi, auntie. Um, the women of the kitchen beaming with this hug. And auntie did that every single day for two and a half years. That was her job description. That's what she... <laughs> She was the glue that made everything work. And with that hug every single day, I don't even know how to explain to you the love that occurred between front of the house and back of the house. And then the kitchen women, they meshed so well, they created a job for auntie. They, so auntie was doing a little bit of dessert, she was doing a little bit of light dishes, but she had a job. And it was all based on that hug. And then we suddenly have a God closet, and the God closet has the Virgin Mary. A lot of Mary was in the God closet. <laughs> Krishna, Shiva, Guru Nanak, Guru Gobind Singh. I mean, it was a freaking God... Oh, no, it was a... It was a <laughs> It was a beautiful closet, right? It was really, really, it was a beautiful closet. And so the restaurant was, we did it. We actually did it. Vigis staff didn't need to come. And it was, it, inside our four walls, it was a wonderful, wonderful world. But then, I'm going to go now back to Amazon now, right? So Amazon did not want a fine dining restaurant there. The employees did not want a fine dining restaurant there. And for as happy as we were, front of the house and back of the house and everything, um, I was being harassed by the customers. Um, they wanted discounts. Now, another thing that I had done was um, I had forged a lot of relationships with the farmers there. Um, my cuisine, again, same thing as Vidge's, organic, local. I wasn't going to compromise on my carbon footprint. And the recipes, everything was cooked by hand. And we had, I mean, it was, it was a wonderful restaurant. They want a discount with their badges. And I said, no, I don't, we don't give discounts. Um, they really wanted discounts. No, I don't, I don't give discounts. And then um, the Indian guys there, the Indian guys had a very tough time that an Indian woman was running an expensive restaurant. Not all of them, but enough that I would go in and I would get comments like, well, you're not really an Indian. Where's the bun on your head? That's the kind, that, that's the kind of stuff I was told. There was another group of Indian guys who wanted all the chits right, of other customers that they could go back to Amazon and claim the expense. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not giving you those. And then I was told, well, you know what? We have an internal system. We have an internal internet system. We're Indian. All we need to do is say, we're Indian. Shonic Restaurant is not authentic or any good. Don't go. So if you don't give us the chits, we can spread that word. And I was like, I'm not giving you any chits. And it was just, it was nonstop. And then I also realized that um, Seattle didn't like South Lake Union. Seattle at that, South Lake Union and the whole, they were still getting to know each other. So we were dead. We were not busy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday was, you know, one way or the other. Fridays and Saturdays we were busy because everybody then on the weekend would come in and come to the restaurant. But that wasn't enough for us to ever make any money. Oz and I were hoping that after about three months that, you know what, we could keep our Vancouver lives and maybe just go to Seattle, each of us, like once a week, like for, per month. But we were both three days Seattle, four days Vancouver. Three days Seattle, four days Vancouver for two and a half years for not making any money. Now, for the longest time, you know what, we, we did it. It was, it was a beautiful place. It was wonderful. But it was getting exhausting. It was really, it was just getting exhausting. On the one hand, in Seattle, for all of what Amazon did, I loved, I loved being a female chef in Seattle. There were a lot of us there, and we were respected. I was not a minority. I was not attached to another man. And I want to be clear, a lot of female food writers also enjoyed attaching me to another man. I, I just want, we got to be equal opportunity here. In Seattle, I was my own. 
I, I started, you know, I did a lot of projects with Seattle Arts and Letters. I interviewed Mother Joffrey on stage for her memoir. I, um, I did a lot of cooking events. And one most important thing I forgot to mention, which was the main point, is um, we opened December 1st. At the end of February of uh, 2012, Right, so like a couple of months, Oz and I found out that Shawnik Restaurant with the Ethiopian and Indian women cooking in the back was one of the ten, uh, one of the twelve semifinalists for James Beard, best new restaurant in the entire United States, and we accomplished that. Right, so so I had a lot of accomplishments there, but again, it was exhausting. It was mentally tiring to be there, and. Um, I was losing my friends in Vancouver because the four days in Vancouver it was all about Vidges, Rangoli, and my two daughters. We had two kids. Vikram and I had split up by this point, and so I was also carrying the the, the loss of my family had broken up, and uh, so Vikram would come to the house, and then we would you know like swap the torch when I would come. It was it was nothing was organized. And in Seattle, I was drinking a lot, I was partying all the time, and I did, I wasn't a mom in Seattle, right? And so this little shift of life for zero money, it, was, it, was, it wasn't making any sense. And so um, we kept going, and we weren't getting higher, and then construction was happening, and uh, it was New Year's Eve. Uh, I was, I just turned 50, so that would have been New Year's Eve 2014, basically, December 31st, 2014. And um, I was sad, I was, I was sad. I was turning 50 years old, and I was sad. I didn't have a life. I had beautiful restaurants. I loved everybody in the restaurant. But what was I doing, right? One daughter had gone off to university, to uh, Montreal. The younger 15-year-old was it. I was sad. I'd lost my friends. I didn't really have. I, I, I just wasn't. I, I was like this, right? I was like this. And um, everybody went to bed, and it was about 12.30. My sister was visiting from New York with my niece and nephew. They were both sleeping with me on my king-size bed, but they were spread out like this. And so um, I just lied down on my carpet. And New Year's Eve, I think from about 1 a.m. until about 3 or 4 a.m., I just lied on the floor. And I got lost with that girl on the airplane. And I just started talking to her, and I felt like I owed her something because that girl on the airplane, even though it was me, she was so brave and she was so scared. And I remembered the smile she put on her face when she got off that plane because she knew, right? She knew that her high maintenance parents weren't going to do it. She knew, she, I didn't have mom and dad to say, hey, I'm scared. I couldn't do it. They were more scared than I was, right? So that girl was so brave and she put that smile on that face and I just lied there and thinking, okay, what did she want? Like, what, what do I do for you, right? In exchange for your braveness, what do I do? And then I thought, you're 50 years old, hopefully half of your life. You, you have, like, if, if a woman like, what have I been doing? If a woman in my situation could not make a quality of life decision, then who in this world could? And so I just talked to her. I daydreamed about India. I don't know. All of it, the whiteness of my first five years, I just sort of floated in it. And I didn't really make a decision. I didn't even like openly say it, but I woke up New Year's Eve. I called up O's. And, you know, he picks up when it's me. That's the nice thing about me. and knows is we pick up right away when the other person calls. I said, O's? And he goes, yes. And I said, what do you think about closing Shawnick Restaurant down? And there was a pause. And I said, O's, we're exhausted. We don't have a life. Like, what do you think? If we do it the right way, what do you think? And he took a deep breath and he said, I feel the same way. Yes, let's do it. And so... Um, March 15th, we decided it was our date to close down Shawnick Restaurant. And when Oz and I spoke to our staff, we gave them a lot of time. We trusted our staff. We were, there's no way I was going to pull that trick that don't tell your staff until like a week beforehand. No, no, no. No, a lot went into that restaurant. So Oz and I sat the whole staff down in front of the house and back of the house. We told them, and, and there were so many tears. And then I remember Tyler saying, Really? We thought that the two of you were going to tell us that you're getting married. <laughs> and, uh, 
And Oz looked appalled. Oz looked really appalled. And I was like, hey, hey, don't look that appalled, okay? Not that bad of an idea, technically. Um, you know, I mean. Um, but there were tears. There were so many tears. And um, we did it. So by this time, Amazon is, J I forgot to say JB. We couldn't say his name. Um, he was he was my landlord. And so we had to figure out a way to get out of this 12-year lease. And um, there's a lot of work and stuff to be done. But honestly, in the end, I got to say that we made the public announcement. And um, I talked to the staff. And, and, and it was actually, it was Tutu and Gabriella mostly. And then Auntie. And Auntie said, you know what, Miruji? Um, we're OK. We're OK. And um, you don't worry about us. And then Tutu, Tutu said to me, she goes, so the Ethiopian staff called me Meru, and my Punjabi staff called me Miru. No, no that's the Americans. Um, Miru. I have lots of different pronunciations of my name. <laughs> Anyways, and so it was um, Gabrielle, it was Tutu, and she said to me, she goes, Meru, um, being black in America is very hard. And she said, but I'm not black American. My family is not black American. We are Ethiopian. But you come to America, and everybody treats you like you're a black American. It's no good. And she said, so it's really hard. She said, before I found out that you were hiring, she said, it took me one, one year I was looking for a job. Nobody would even hire me as a cleaner, she said. I couldn't find it. She said, I had given up. And then I had prayed, OK, God, it's in your hands now. And then Bizu's husband said, there's a lady hiring. It doesn't matter if you can't do anything. She's hiring you. <laughs> And so she said, she said to me, she goes, we're going to be okay. And she said to me, she goes, Meru, she said, go home. And she said, go home, go make your life, we're okay. And um, that's what I did. That's what Oz did. And um, that's the end of what I have to say to you. But um, my point for standing here is I said to you earlier on, you know, I'm speaking for my people. And I was an Indian. I was not an immigrant for my first five years when I was in Delhi, but I can't remember it. On that plane, I turned into an immigrant in America. And in America, where I was raised until I was 30 years old, I was asked left and right, where are you from? And which is fine, you just get used to it. And then at the age of 30, I moved here. I have been nothing but an immigrant in my solid memory. That's all I know. So I don't have a people. I, don't, I can't say I'm Canadian, I'm American, I'm Indian. But I can stand up to you here saying, you know what, I'm an immigrant. And I'm super proud of it. And we immigrants all the world over, right? Don't get mad at us because we want to come to your country, OK? Don't get mad at us because there's a lot of us that want to come. And oh my god, there's just too many. We, well, our infrastructure is going to suffer, OK? Don't get mad at us, OK? We understand about infrastructure, but we also remember that we come from homes. And also, don't think you're privileged. Right? I hear this word, my privilege, my privilege, my privilege. Just know your place. Know who you are and your place on this earth. That's your privilege, as far as I'm concerned. And do something about your place on this earth. We are. We're moving around. We're trying to find homes for our kids. Kids are trying to make their mom and dad happy. Right? We are people, right? And so, again, just appreciate that even, not even, but we immigrants, we have privilege. We have inner privilege. We have a lot of love. We take care of ourselves, our families, right? So it's not about privilege. It's about your place on this earth. And do what you can and be responsible for it. So thank you, everybody. Okay. Okay, we will hop into questions. So raise your hand real high uh, if you have a question. And of course, if you're on Zoom, I don't know what the protocol is, but. We'll, we'll yell at you. If okay, you. wonderful. All right, would you like to come back up on stage? <laughs> I wonder how many times you've been the first question. <laughs> 35 times, 36 times. Thank you, thank you. I love the questions. <laughs> It creates a dialogue. I want to thank you for sharing your journey, but also in your interview in, in online, you introduced the book, Beloved. I'm uh, sorry, employees. 
Yeah, thank you for that. My question is about Indian food now in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Is there any Indian food left? Because <laughs> it's all factory made and, and the prices are just skyrocketing because non-Indians are eating now. So they don't know what is Indian food, so everything goes. So do you feel Indians are losing Indian food in Vancouver? Uh, this is not a pitch for veggies, or for the restaurant. Do you mean at home or do you mean at restaurants? I love cooking, so I cook at home. Yeah. But in the restaurants, can you recommend besides Vigi? Any other restaurant because there's no fast food. You know, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not lying. I do not eat Indian food out. I'm sick of Indian food. Um, that's all we're cooking. I, I mean, you're, you've kind of like laid it for me to pitch Vigis here. We cook everything by hand at Vigis. We get the spices whole at Vigis, and we, we sift them by hand. We roast them by hand. We grind it. We make our own spices. We make our own yogurts. We're making everything by hand at Vigis. And that's why it is more expensive, because labor is expensive. Indian food is very labor intensive, if it's made correctly. And that's why you don't see a lot of Indian restaurants, because it's really hard to make it work business-wise. So yet, yeah, Vidges is doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I think so. Um, Hi. Um, you talked about when you opened the rest, when you went from Vidges, you went to Seattle to open a restaurant. Between there, you had Rangoli. Rangoli was 100% yours, I thought. Yes. So that was your first real independent restaurant. Uh, no, we were doing, but Vikram and I are, we are, we were partners, our partner. Rangoli is, Rangoli was your partner? Did, Vidges, I adopted Vidges when Vidges was a three month old baby. Yeah. Okay. Vikram, it was Vikram's biological baby. I adopted Vidges when it was three months old. Vikram and I together gave birth to Rangoli. And from a mother's point of view, okay. there is no difference between that adopted baby and the birth baby. Okay. So, and so then, then Seattle was, yes, in between it. Rangoli, we closed in uh, May of 2020 because of the pandemic. Was because the, that's early on. That's early on. Yes. The pandemic had just started. Yep. Uh, yeah. So my partner, uh, he is a psychologist, and uh, he was working on a book that was supposed to be the psychology of climate change. And then halfway through working on that book in about 2017, 2018, he switched over and he got all like, oh, sweetheart, a pandemic is coming. And I said, what? And so he switched over to write a book called The Psychology of Pandemics. And so he predicted, I'm not joking, he predicted that a pandemic was going to happen somewhere between 2020 and 2023. And it happened, but because of him, I knew what was going to happen. I knew this was not a three month. So very quickly, I said, Vikram, if we want Vidges to survive, we have got to cut. We've got to do something. And so that's how we decided to wow. shut Rangoli. I miss it. Oh, well, me too. Oh, I really miss Rangoli. Hi, Mira. Thanks. Uh, wonderful talk. And Thank you're you. an awesome storyteller. I love all the timelines, all the dates. Um, the story, the part about New Year's Eve really struck out to me. You had this, uh, you had this like epiphany moment. And I'm wondering, as you look back on the journey, were there other moments prior to like that New Year's Eve, you know, you said there was a serious of sadness of your 50th birthday and like you, your life was out of balance. Do you have a takeaway from that whole experience? Uh, of the, was there a moment earlier that you could have, there was some insights so you could have made shifts earlier? And I just wanted to get sort of a little more thoughts on, on your takeaway from that experience? While it felt right, it was the right thing to do. And it felt right for a long time. Um, when we decided to shut down, it felt right. But it took me, like I remember, I was, Sigour Ross was playing in the background even. Um, it, it, it just, it's, I mean, I'm very, very, uh, you know, we're talking about reverie here. Uh, I spend a lot of time daydreaming. I'm really happy. This like suits me fine. I spend so much time like this and just thinking of things. And I trust it when my gut tells me to do something. And so the two and a half years that we were in Seattle, um, it just felt like it was something I had to do. It, it was some, I, I had to do it. And right when I felt like my, I always felt like my work is done. I really did. I almost felt like, okay, you know what? Your work is done. It, it's time to now do work on yourself, get back on track with yourself again. And so I, I, have, I, I have a really good relationship with my, um, 
gut instinct, I think. I felt like a failure at the end. I want to be clear. I didn't say, yay, I'm done with Seattle. I did. I felt like a failure with that restaurant. And, you know, one thing that happened in Seattle, which I didn't mention, which is really hard, was the food writers who kept comparing how will she fare without Vikram. Okay? Vikram wasn't doing that. Vikram was there opening night with me. Right? All right, we're going to do this. Right? He was there. He was there to help me whenever I requested. But the public really wanted to know, how was I going to fare without Vikram? And that ate me up. Right? I did the right thing. I was so proud. I was so, it was the most beautiful thing ever I've created. Like what I had in Seattle with those, that Shonic restaurant, we don't even have that at Vidges. We do not have that finesse of emotional beauty that we created there, but I left there feeling as if I had failed in the eyes of the public. I couldn't even look at the word Seattle for about two years because I felt like I did. Now I stand here and I talk about it for the very first time and I feel like it was the most successful thing I've ever done. And it was a success to be able to decide that no, we're done. And I'm just, oh, just curious at what point you made that shift where you had that change of perspective, like no, actually it was a great success. I was ready. I was ready to think of it. That a lot of times you're not ready, right? To feel a certain way. You have to be ready to take it in, I think. And I was ready to finally say, you know what, that was awesome. That was really Thank good. You. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I have a question. Um, what is your relationship with food and how did food become a part of your path? Like, did you always have that strong sense as, ever since you were a child or was it something that developed along the way? No, I did not have a really, I had a negative relationship with Indian food um, growing up because I said I was an immigrant kid. I wanted to fit in and my mom cooked her sorrows out. My mom was cooking. I would go to school with my hair stinking, my clothes smelling. Um, I hated how I smelled when I went out. So when I left home at 18 and 20, I vowed I was not going to be cooking Indian food. Um, my master's degree is in economic development. Um, when I started Vidges at 30, when I moved here after I married Vikram, I, I, I didn't even know how to use a knife. Right? I, did not, I know how to eat food. I didn't know how to use a knife. I could make one chickpea curry and I could make pasta. Right? Um, and this is one other thing I would love to tell especially, I mean, everybody, young person, we have this problem here that we're encouraged to come up with a passion. All right? We celebrate what's your passion and we're supposed to follow our passion. Well, what if we don't have one? Right? What if we really honest to God, we don't, I don't have a passion or what if, I do have a passion. My real passion, I wanted to be a novelist. Okay, that's my passion when I was 18, 19, 20. I didn't want to do what I'm doing right now. I wanted to be a novelist. I wanted to be Margaret Atwood. I didn't want her to be Margaret Atwood. I wanted to be Margaret Atwood. Um, but that wasn't meant to be. And so you end up, you create a passion. So you grab what's in front of you and you turn that into something that you can feel passionate about. It doesn't need to come from in here. It can come from outside. Okay, it, is this on? Sorry. We'll do one. Yeah, I was just gonna say it is 10 a.m. So if you have to sneak out, we understand. Yeah. Just please do so quietly. We'll be last. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you. Is a child of immigrants who came here with nothing but their suitcases. Yep. You probably had to touch down maybe in Iceland to fuel up if you were coming that way. Um, I also love your story. Thank you. It means a lot. I'm tearing up. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, what does your gut tell you about the women you worked with in Seattle? Are you going to tell a story or revisit them to see how their lives are coming along now? Um, so the women that I have been, uh, been in touch with, it's like any other group. Some are thriving and some are not. All right, so Babu, the one who made me hire auntie, like the one who said, no, you are not letting go of her because she's my ride. Um, so we also hired Babu's daughter, Rimple. At the, you know, as we grew, um, you know, we hired her daughter and everything. Babu ended up not getting a job of the same. She ended, up, she ended up managing the kitchen in the daytime, okay? 
But then she ended up from managing this restaurant and running the day staff to working in a meat packers because that was the only other job that she could get. So during COVID, she was working at a meat packing, but with her money, she was able to send her two daughters to university. And so she's thriving. Well, I hope that you take this experience and turn it into a novel. Oh, and the stories of these wonderful yeah. people that you've yeah. met. I was just telling her the exact same thing, so. All right. Um, Maybe Mara could add what I think we had one we'll final off. question. Oh, yeah, you have it. Go ahead. It should be on. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. And that was also some spectacular storytelling. I felt like I was, like, in the story. And um, you can really feel the emotional connections and relationships you've built there. And I was curious... Having arrived at this pe like sense of inner peace with yourself now and the work that you've done there, um, what it has taught you moving forward and what your projects are, like where you're at in your life right now, and is um, is bring it on. <laughs> Honestly, bring it on. Uh, when I left home at 18, I I was so ready to be me because up until 18, uh, uh, my mom and dad were right here. Right? Not hovering over me, but their lives were right there. My father actually got diagnosed with, uh, you know, he's a refugee child. There are no psychologists and counselors in refugee camps. And so um, for me, it was, a, it was a growth period. And so I just think it's how, for me, it's bring it on. I'm not afraid. So each thing I do, um, and I, I, I do that because of that plane ride. Like, I really have anchored myself in that plane ride. Nothing I've done in my life was as intimidating as getting off that plane when I was five. So it's bring it on. Yeah. Nehru? Yes? I don't remember if um, Heidi mentioned it in the trivia bits in your intro, but you did share with us, so I'm aware that you're okay talking about this, that you intend to go into politics. Yes. You're going to yeah. run you're going to run for the Green Party in 26. That's your pretension. So uh, yeah, um, so that's the next project, right? So uh, I hope I don't shut down the Green Party the way I shut down Seattle. But um, <laughs> 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 No, but you know, um, I'm now I'm to, my my kids are older, they're adults. So I'm in a really good place. Uh, Vidges is doing fine. The pandemic is done. And so it's time for me to now focus on home. When she said go home, I needed that to feel that, okay, Vancouver is Miru Dalwala's home, not Miru Dalwala, business partner, wife of Vikram Vij, but it's Miru Dalwala's home. And what am I going to do in my home? And so um, I'm not at that federal level. I'm not a provincial level. I love my home. So I decided to, you know what? Climate change is it for me. Climate crisis, not climate change. Um, and sitting and talking about it at a dinner table, you're not doing anything. And so I decided, okay, only change is gonna happen at the municipal level. And so, uh, yeah, I joined the Vancouver Green Party and I'm on the board of the Vancouver Green Party and I work on events and fundraising. And so I'm gonna be doing a lot of events for the Vancouver Green Party and hopefully next election running. I just presented yesterday to council on, um, on banning natural gas, which is actually methane gas. Uh, it's not natural gas, but banning uh, natural gas hookups in all new homes. Uh, I spoke, it, the motion, it, did, it got uh, rejected, so it's gonna keep happening. Um, but yeah, I'm testing my waters with local politics now. Yeah. <laughs>